India's GDP growth came in at 8.2% for the quarter ended September 2025. Took a lot of people by surprise because the consensus estimates were lower. Why did this happen? And what do inflation and the GDP deflator have to do with this? Let's take a look. Hello and welcome back to Business Matters of the Hindu with me, K. Bharat Kumar. GDP is typically derived from sectors categorized into three, typically primary, secondary and tertiary. The primary sector is one in which there is resource extraction, such as in agriculture. The secondary sector includes those such as manufacturing and construction. And tertiary brings in sectors such as finance and banking and so on. India's GDP growth for the quarter ended September was spurred by the secondary and tertiary sectors which came in at 8.1% and 9.2% respectively in terms of growth. Let's look at the specifics. Manufacturing at 9.1% and construction at 72 registered healthy growth rates. Financial, real estate and professional services also saw robust growth at 10.2%. Agriculture and related services at 3.5% and electricity, gas, water supply and other utility services at 4.4% saw moderate growth. Real Private final consumption expenditure grew 7.9%. This compares with 6.4% in the same quarter a year ago. If this growth momentum sustains, it's actually a healthy thing for the economy. This would be indicative of increasing demand. And when private demand increases, companies in the private sector would start expanding their investments, including in private capital expenditure. When that happens, it would allow the government to move funds away from public capex into other important areas such as public health care and public education. Again, as we said, if this growth momentum sustains, then it's actually a healthy sign because already there is potential for revenue collections by the government to start dipping in the coming months, given the benefits that it has extended to taxpayers on the income tax and GST fronts, allowing for lower payments. In a report earlier this week, Goldman Sachs said that it expected the government, the central government in India, to meet its fiscal deficit targets for this current financial year by reducing public capex to offset potential shortfalls that it could anticipate on the income tax and GST fronts. The report highlighted that central government capex contracted sharply in October, declining by about 28% year on year. This fall was mainly due to lower capex transfers to states, even as defense capital expenditure continued to remain strong. Now, more often than not, there is a difference between nominal GDP growth and real GDP growth. Nominal GDP is calculated using current prices and real GDP is calculated using constant prices. Key difference between the two is referred to as the GDP deflator. Now what is the GDP deflator? Also called the implicit price deflator. This is a measure of inflation. It is a ratio of the value of goods and services an economy produces in a particular year at current prices to that of prices that prevailed during the base year. The base year could be anything. It could be 2011, uh, related prices 2012, 2013, that each government fixes as a constant in a particular period of time. This ratio helps explain the nature of GDP growth, whether GDP grew merely on account of higher prices or whether it grew because of an increase in output. Now let's take a look at the real GDP and nominal GDP growth rates over the past five quarters. As you can see, the deflator for the latest quarter, which is the first row on the chart on your screens, was only 0.5 percentage points. Whereas for the same quarter in the previous year, that is the last row of the chart on your screens, the deflator was a difference between 5.6% and 8%, which is 2.4 percentage points. This was indicative of the inflation at the respective points in time. In our editorial, we point to this very statistical effect at play. Retail inflation has been on a downward trajectory for some months now. In fact, in October, it recorded 0.25%, which is the lowest in this CPI or Consumer Index series. This has contributed to a GDP deflator, which is lower than 1%. A deflator this low mechanically inflates real GDP relative to nominal. Should inflation rise or input costs firm up, for example, if oil prices climb as India diversifies away from Russian crude, then headline GDP growth may moderate. Also remember that the effect of global headwinds is still to play out fully. The US's two-stage tariff on India landed in August mid-quarter, that is for the quarter we are considering, July, August and September. So there was some front-loading of exports to make sure that these were recorded before the tariff date. So this could have added to the Q2 momentum. A few days before the GDP data was released for the latest quarter, 
the IMF or the International Monetary Fund gave a C rating to India's GDP assessment methodology. What does this mean? The chart on your screens shows what each grade means for countries that are assessed. These range from A, B, C to D. These estimate how adequate the data provided to the fund is for surveillance. The IMF noted in its annual Article 4 assessment of India's economic framework that some methodological weaknesses somewhat hamper surveillance and warrant an overall sectoral rating for the national accounts of C. For example, it points to India using 2011-12 as a base year for calculating the data. The fund refers to this year as being outdated. It also points to India using wholesale price indices as sources of data rather than a producer price index which India does not have and the fund feels that this is less than ideal. It also points out that periodic sizable discrepancies between the production and expenditure approaches of measuring GDP that may indicate the need to enhance the coverage of the expenditure approach data and the informal sector. It is important to note that in an earlier instance too, the IMF had given a C rating for India's GDP assessment methodology. So nothing has changed, the rating has remained. My former colleague at Business Line and now head of advisory at investment platform Prime Investor, Aarti Krishnan, weighed in with her views in a LinkedIn post. She feels that some analysts think there's something fishy about this GDP data and point to the GDP deflator being so low at 0.5%. She acknowledges, sure, there are some problems with India's GDP deflator, but with the WPA and CPA, that is the wholesale price index and the consumer price index ruling so low, there is no mystery about the 0.5%. She says, to get to GDP, volume of output is counted in some sectors and value in others. As to observers questioning the reliability of data while pointing to the term discrepancies that features in the GDP release statement, she says, those are errors and are a regular feature of GDP accounting. She points to the fact that this term occurs in every GDP statement. She says, they crop up when GDP as estimated by the income method differs from that from the expenditure method. As an example, she says, to think of one's own monthly income versus spending, they rarely tally to the last rupee. That brings us to the nugget of information that we have for you each week. Here it goes. Did you know that slightly more than a decade ago, some African countries began an exercise called rebasing to help calculate GDP numbers more accurately? In that period, Kenya, Nigeria, Tanzania, Uganda and Zambia all completed this rebasing exercise. Nigeria's rebasing, which lifted its GDP and almost doubled it to $510 billion in 2013, saw its economy surpass South Africa's to become the largest in Africa. Kenya's revised 2013 GDP augmented its per capita income from $994 to $1,270 almost, allowing the country to be recategorized from a low income to a lower middle income country as per World Bank metrics. And here's the quiz question for this week. When Nigeria rebased its GDP calculations in 2013, how many more industries did it add to the calculations? For context, it used to consider 33 industries before the estimates were revised for that year. And here's the answer to last week's quiz question. The question was in how many languages is the denomination of the Indian currency note displayed on the language panel on banknotes? The answer is 15 of the 22 official languages of India find mention in this display. That's all we have for you folks this week. If you enjoyed what you saw, do not forget to like, share and subscribe. And till we meet again, have a wonderful time ahead.